Hello everyone. Well, first of all, I want to thank you all for subscribing to this channel. It's been really overwhelming that you guys have responded so well. Uh, I did have an amazing person as my first guest, so I'm going to endeavor to hold up those high standards. So anyway, firstly, um, I decided after that amazing reaction, what I would do is do a second video in a week. Yes, it's amazing, right? Second video in a week. And I thought, well, what do people really want to talk about? Maybe something that they don't deal with on a day-to-day -day basis or they, they are really curious about. And so I asked the question on X. And the question was, what would you like to know about Hollywood? And you guys just, put a bunch of amazing questions on there. So I'm going to just go straight into it and start answering them. It's probably going to get me into a lot of trouble, but hey, whatever. So the first one comes from Arden Young. And she said, how has the quality and subject matter of film changed during your career? That's a really, really great question because, I mean, clearly we are seeing that Hollywood is just a disaster right now. The quality has just gone down and down and down. When I very first came to Hollywood in, well, when I first came to Hollywood in 2000, which was when I, when I first flew over, I thought that I was in heaven. I was like a kid in a candy store. It was just the quality of stuff that was coming out of there was amazing. The screenplays were just incredible, absolutely incredible. And over the years, I mean, look, I, I came over and the first movie I did in Hollywood was Black Hawk Down that went to Oscars. I mean, if you're going to come over and do a film, you do something like that and the world is your oyster. And it really was, for those of us that were in that film, it was, it was a really amazing time, a golden time. And I got all kinds of auditions, offers, meetings, because what, you know, so firstly, I'm going to tell you guys the way it goes. So in the, in the entertainment industry, the kind of bottom level is when you go and you audition. Um, actually, no, that's not true. The bottom level is trying to get the audition, right? And now I'm going to talk about that a little bit later because it's, uh, it's very interesting. Uh, these days now, how people can get into the industry because everything's online. You can submit yourself on websites. That, that wasn't like that when I first came to Hollywood. You had to get an agent, which is an ordeal in, in and of itself. So um, getting in, do an audition, and then the next level, especially when it comes to uh, TV, is you audition for producers, which means you don't have to go through the main like, I hate to call it this, but it is what it is. It's called a cow call. Like everyone goes to that. Then when you go to producers, you're in a more elite group of people, which means you've been basically given their thumbs up from the studio. Maybe you've done an audition previously for them, and they're like, yeah, you know, we, we approve him. We think he, him or her. Um, they are able to go to the next level. So they don't have to go through an approval process. So anyway, you go to producers. And then if you are at the next level up, you just get offers. Right now, sometimes you might have a big act to say, hey, listen, uh, I want to do this job. And the director's like, no. I know that Tom Cruise had this with Jerry Maguire. They didn't. Cameron Crowe um, said, well, I don't think Tom Cruise can do comedy. And, and clearly he was wrong. Uh, anyone who's seen Tropic Thunder, which is, you know, one of my, one of my favorite movies, couldn't get made today, right? He's amazing in that. He's absolutely amazing. Uh, he's an amazing actor anyway. I mean, I think he's, and I'm segueing on this, but he's such a movie star that people forget how good he is as an actual actor. He's very good. Um, so there's all these different levels, right? And I was very lucky because coming off a movie with Michael Caine and then coming in and doing Black Hawk Down and then I got a pilot with Jerry Bruckheimer and Simon Kinberg. Simon Kinberg wrote, it was actually his first, um, his first big job before he went on to do um, all the X-Men films and whatever. He's a very, very talented guy. So I did that with a guy called Jim Gillespie who did, uh, I know what you did last summer. And so there's a le there was a level there that you get to where you just get the offer. All right, they just call you up and say, hey, do you want to do this? 
And when you've got there, normally you don't come out of that sphere. So the reason why I'm telling you all that is when I first came to Hollywood, I just got all the greatest scripts. I got all the top level scripts. I mean, I remember getting wanted. Not saying that they were offering me those roles, but I was in that kind of, in that area. So I tested for Superman. Um, There's a whole load of different things. So the screenplays were amazing. And all you've got to do is really look, in, look at the quality of films that were coming out around that period of time. It was, it was pretty amazing. And there was different tiers, right? So you had your, your big movies, which Black Hawk Down was one of them. I think it was about $18 million. But there was a whole band of movies around the $25 million area. And I remember thinking, I don't want to do a $25 million movie. I just did an $80 million movie. I want to keep doing those like in my naivety. And those now have gone, by the way. Those $25 million movies have gone. So there's a whole um, band of films that you used to be getting that were, you know, decent quality. Certainly Hollywood, uh, uh, horror movies were in that band. because. So what they used to do about horror movies, by the way, is nobody wanted to do them, right? So what they would do was they would pay you a lot of money to do them. So <laughs> you see a lot of actors that you go, well, why, why are they doing that film? Because horror movies, for the most part, are profitable for the studio. They're going to make a lot of money on a horror movie because it was a real genre where people loved going to uh, the movies to go and get scared. I don't know if it's like that anymore. I I know that there's a a bunch of horror fans out there. I think they've been really underutilized as a group because they're very loyal. Uh, They know their thing. I mean, I think it was bloody disgusting was a, is a website that it was really great. I mean, that the critics on there are really, really good. You know, they know their thing. They love horror. Um, and it's a really great genre. Anyway, so all those movies were coming out. There were really good horror movies coming out as well. And as time went by, Firstly, you saw people move towards cable television. So initially, nobody wanted to do uh, cable, right? They wanted that you do HBO, Showtime, but that was it. You didn't do, you would never even look at doing a AMC. Or, and then they came out with The Walking Dead and, it, it, and Breaking Bad. And it just changed everything. Because what they did, which is what people need to understand now, it's kind of crazy they don't get it, is they went. So for The Walking Dead, they went and got Frank Darabont, one of the greatest directors ever. And he came in and did a terrific job. And that show has been going on for years and years and years. It lost me a few years ago. But I mean, still, they got great actors on it. It was well-directed, well-written. And there was a big migration towards that. So actors all of a sudden, they were like, hey, listen, I can go and do this. This is really quality stuff. Because back then, you could choose. It wasn't. Like there was such a, um, a small amount, a little amount of projects going on. There was a lot of projects going on. It wasn't so saturated as it is now with the streaming services like Amazon and Netflix, but there was a lot of projects going on and you could, you could definitely see the levels. And I turned down a ton of stuff. Like for an actor that did movies, you never did TV. You did not want to do TV. And I turned down a bunch a TV show. <laughs> it was probably silly uh, in hindsight because it changed more towards the, a lot of the content got better in television, right? If you look at Game of Thrones and um, House of Dragon and uh, and those kind of things, they they really like dulled in the writing. Mad Men, all those shows really upped the stakes on the writing. But when you know around two thousand, it wasn't really like that. So I then saw a move towards more sexual content, maybe in about the mid 2000s. And initially it was to shock. And then, and and then after that, I thought, you know what, this is just laziness. It's just lazy writing. You know, people didn't want to think about how they got the characters out of certain situations. And that just got worse and worse and worse. Right. And then you started seeing the agendas coming in. Initially it was like, very subtle. And then it got to dominate. It became the most important thing about that show. And I have no, I have no desire 
to do those kind of projects. And I turned down a lot of them. I remember going to a meeting on one particular movie and I read it and I was like, this just, it doesn't sit right with me. I don't like what they're saying in this screenplay. And there's a lot of pressure on you because there's a lot of money riding on you. Your agent is going out there and they're putting you up for stuff. And you're around a, a very small group of people at that level. Certainly when I was with the biggest agencies, you're in a very small group. So you see the same like five, six guys going in. And, you, and so you're like, hang on a minute. Well, you don't want them to stop sending you because they're like, oh, you know, Marsden, he, he won't go up for that. But I started doing that. So I said, no, I'm not, I, I, don't, I don't respond to that. And I didn't. I didn't respond to it. And I would go a little bit of time and I'm like, you know what? I need to go and do a film now. I, I really should go and do it. Um, I'm fed up with waiting for, because a lot of movies get pushed, right? Uh, people don't understand this, but you can have a movie go and then something will happen. It gets pushed like six months, eight months. And sometimes that's an opportunity because you can jump around and do another film in between. Sometimes you're contracted, so you can't. But they would get pushed and you'd be like, oh, I'm not working for like eight months. And people look, they might look at your resume and go, oh, well, you know, well, why didn't you do it? I, for, for me, I got offered a ton of films, tons and tons of films. I turned down a lot of them. Other ones were turned down for me that I didn't know about. That's a whole other conversation for another time. But yes, in answer to the question, the quality has gone down. There are scripts out there that are amazing. They're just sitting there on the shelf. And part of the problem is if you don't have agents that are distributing them around or, or people like me that would like to do those kind of movies, for example, war films that tell really great stories. If you can't get access to those screenplays because the agents are blocking you, which is another problem, then how do you get them made? But they're all there. I mean, look, the, the greatest living screenwriter is David Mamet. And when was the last time you saw a David Mamet screenplay? Do a little bit of research on David Mamet, who is awesome, by the way. I've met him multiple times, and I was going to do a film with him. So go and have a look at and see, see the screenplays he's written. He's amazing. He's great. And then see why his movies aren't getting made. But the agenda took over, and you started seeing people who actually were set up to fail, right, because they didn't know the job that they were being put in, which is unfair. And they would be put in that job. And everyone would be screaming at them. They're like, like well, you know, what are you doing? Like, why isn't this happening? Why isn't that? And they're there going, hang on a second, because you're not going to turn down a job that gives you a pay bump of 50 grand. Uh, you, you're not going to turn that down. So it's unfair on those people. But you started seeing people that really weren't qualified or didn't have the experience. Now, maybe that's something that should have been addressed, right? Like you start getting more mentor programs. But they started giving people the jobs that just didn't, that weren't qualified for them. And so then what happens is Disney Marvel is what happens. So anyway, I'm going to leave that there. I'm going to move on to the next one. Uh, Shiloh says, did you ever get contacted by the Wolfpack? I, I have no idea who that is. So I'm sorry, Shiloh. I don't know who the Wolfpack was. Or is. Uh, Stephen Williams asks, and by the way, thank you, Stephen, for subscribing to me on X as well as on um, YouTube. What percentage of Hollywood actors are closet conservatives? <laughs> That's a really difficult question to answer because I think the Overton window, window has shifted so much that people with just who would pretty much consider themselves to be middle of the road or even liberal are now considered to be right wing maniacs because everything's gone so wacky, right? Everything's gone so crazy. Uh, so they don't talk out, they don't speak out. The ones that you know are, you know are. Like they're, they're out on Twitter, X, they're out on social media. And these are people that, that aren't like crazy. You know, they're not crazy. Uh, they're just people that have a certain set of values. Many of them have made a lot of money. So, and they're older, by the way, which is we, part of the problem is the younger folks have seen what, what has happened to other conservatives in the industry. 
And they're like, I'm not saying anything. I'm not, I'm not even saying anything. I'm not coming. So w- with the vaccine, by the way, that was one of the ways that I feel like conservatives were smeared. And a lot of liberals who are like, you know, crunchy granola people that like, I'm not having that in my body. All of a sudden they found out what it was like to be uh, re- remotely conservative in the industry, which means you get ostracized. The phone stops ringing. The agents drop you. It's real. It really happens. So. What percentage of Hollywood actors are closet conservatives? 5%. How many people in other aspects are conservatives? More. I know that the stunt, stunt men, stunt women, they, they tend to be conservatives for the most part. Not all of them, but I'd say there's, there's a higher percentage of conservative stunt people. Uh, anyway, um, was Harvey Weinstein a lone wolf or me, merely the tip of a filthy big iceberg? Thank you, Tim. And again, Tim, thank you for subscribing to me on X. Um, not a lone wolf. I mean, you, come on. You all know that. Anyway, um, do I know of anyone particular? I didn't experience it. I don't know if it's because, you know, I mean, I'm a six foot three inch guy that's 230 pounds. I didn't really get anyone trying to exploit me in that way. Uh, me have women been exploited yes i know they have because i had one guy in particular in particular come up and tell me about the experience with his wife and it was just unbelievable um you wonder why i do not want to be there anymore so okay the dave since you've been on both sides how would you compare hollywood to the uk entertainment scene are there any defining differences between the two yeah uh, I went back last year to do a, a little film in England. And what really struck me, and this is no diss on American actors, right? Because there are some, like, people like Nick Searcy. He's an amazing actor. He's, he's like, as good as anyone. Um, but I think that what happens in Hollywood is a lot of people go, it's both the, the, the good thing and the bad thing about Hollywood, is you can go there and you can walk off the street and you can become a star. It's amazing. That's the American dream, right? You can be nobody and then become somebody. It's also the bad thing about Hollywood because I've been on set and the basics like hitting your mark, looking at or not looking at the camera, knowing where your eye has to be, uh, your eye line, seeing whether you do something or crossing the line, all all these other things. One of the biggest things that I found uh, is that you have... So, for example, if you're doing a scene and... I saw this with another actor recently I worked with. It took a drink from a cup. I'm like, that's a disaster for you because you've got to match that on every single shot. Brits, for the most part, do that. So when we did Black Hawk Down, Ridley, who is a genius, is very smart because he said, you know, I'm going to have the majority of British actors. Why? Because he knows that they're going to hit the mark, they're going to say their lines, and then they're going to get on with it. And what I've seen increasingly increasingly this doesn't really it's not really for new york actors like guys that come out of new york that have been on broadway that they know their stuff they're they're really really tight but a lot of people just like don't hit their marks they don't know their lines the amount of times that i've worked with people that they you know you know that line in tropic thunder i don't read script script reads me it's like that right they don't they're not prepared they come in they're not prepared they don't know their lines so when i came back to england recently as i was saying what i was what I'd forgotten because I've been over here for 20 years. Man, they were good. Like to a person, they were great. They hit their, they hit their marks. They knew their lines. They were prepared. Uh, it was, the accents were amazing. Everyone had to do an American accent. It's a lot easier for me because I've, I've been over here for 20 years. And that's a, that's a whole other conversation about uh, accents and something that happened on that. I might talk to you about it sometime. But um, they were all solid. From the young 18-year-old, I think he was, he was amazing on that film. Just so much talent, so much talent. And I think part of it is because British actors know, like, you're not going to make a ton of money in acting. Like, you might go and do... I know that was for me. I was like, you know, I really want to be an actor. I'm going to make, like, 250 quid a week doing theatre. And I loved it. So that's what I wanted to do. 
in the back of my mind, I always wanted to do movies, but I'm like, you know, a working class kid from West Bromwich. I'm not going to, I'm not going to become a movie actor. Like that's a million miles away. And, uh, and that's partly, you know, it's funny when you get the trolls online, I'm like, I'm living the dream. Like y- you guys can say whatever you want about me, right? I'm punching way above my weight. Right. I've gone and done stuff that I'd never dreamt of doing. If, if I, I always say this to people as well that sometimes get down about their lives. I say, look, go back and talk to 14 year old or 13 year old you and tell them the life that you've had. They wouldn't believe you. They, most of them would say, that is amazing. I, can, I, can I achieve that? I don't believe I can achieve that. So, perspective is really important. All right. Uh, how difficult is it for a first-time script writer to get into the industry? I have a lot of ideas. This is by Aaron Brown. Um, I have a lot of ideas that I've never been able to do anything with. Well, there's two things there. Did you write the screenplay? Because I get a lot of people come to me and they're like, I've got an idea for a screenplay. But write it. Go write it. That's the first thing. Is it difficult? Yeah, it's really difficult. Is it really difficult to get even into the industry? Yes, it's very difficult. It's a lot easier than what it was. It used to be virtually impossible because you had to get an agent. And to get an agent, how do you get an agent? You have to go, mainly the, the drama schools will give a showcase. This is in the UK. Some of the acting schools over in Los Angeles will do a showcase and, and whatever. But it's very tough to get in. I was lucky because I got into National Youth Theatre, which for anyone who, um, who doesn't know, it's, it's the best youth theatre in the world. And I was very lucky to get into that. Uh, and that set me, that, that set the bar for me so I could go into, into meetings and say, yeah, I'm, I was in National Youth Theatre. It changed, changed everything for me. Because I think that a lot of acting in the UK is is kind of like legacy like you know you have to know somebody right someone's asking me about this you have to kind of know somebody and i just didn't know anybody so i think that national youth Theatre really opened a lot of doors for me so what you have to do this is what i'd say to anyone that wants into it once again to filmmaking number one don't go to film school it's an utter waste of time the amount of people that i know that went to film school and they come out and all they do is they end up being a runner on a set And then you have to work your way up anyway. And nobody gives a damn about your degree. They really don't. So I'd say either go and get on set. You got to be a golfer. You got to pay your dues. And you, the thing about the funny thing is about how liberal Hollywood is, they do reward people that work their way up, right? They do. Because at the end of the day, if you're a producer or a director, you have to deal with so many different things. You have to deal with, um, Firstly, you've got to deal with actors, which is kind of a really weird thing because you're the guy that's paying them, but they have a lot of power. So you have to like babysit actors. I can tell you a lot about that. But you also have to, you know, you may be spending $100,000 a day and you've got to get your day. You have to get it. You can't get any kind of breakdown in communication. And I'm going to address this a little bit later on in one of the other questions. So, uh, King Roblo. Are these strike effects long term? I'm trying to get back to work. Got two days this week as a standing, but it's dry here. Yeah, yeah, they are. And this is the funny thing about SAC. They don't, the, the amount of people that are going to lose health care because of the strike is unbelievable. That there's going to be a lot of people. And for, for I'm not even going to go into it uh, because it's boring, but um, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to lose work for that. And then it looks like IAT are going to go on strike. Yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be rough. Uh, okay, John Mayan. I've been on the TV side of Hollywood, but not the movie side. Is there much of a difference? Yes. Movies, you have a lot of time. You have a lot of time. The other thing with films is you... People say, well, why the budget's so big? You know, why are they so big? A lot of the time, it's because of ego, right? Because you have a clash of egos. Some actor might say, I'm not coming out my trailer. I know about that. Uh, that's why, by the way, when I did my film, I am that man. And if you haven't watched it, go watch it. Uh, I cast myself in the lead because I was like, who's going to turn up on time? Who's going to know all these lines? It was, it was such a tight budget that I I didn't have any wiggle room in that. So I'm like, Oh gosh, okay. I've got to do it. So I did it because I knew I'd turn up on time. I knew I'd 
well, I had to, right? Because I'm directing it as well. So, but I knew the characters and that that's a really big thing. So money on films fixes a lot of stuff. It fixes a lot of stuff. You can have mistakes on set, but then you've still got the big budget that you can you can uh, rectify those things, whether it come back and do reshoots, whatever that might be. So you have a lot of time. Sometimes you have a lot of time. I've, uh, uh, as you go down in the budget, <laughs> you don't get a lot of time in film, but uh, you know, I'm, I normally, I'm a one take wonder. I normally go in there and I get it and I'm off. So uh, mainly it's time. You'll have a bunch of scenes that you have to do on TV shows in a day and you don't have, even half as many on a film, maybe a fraction of that. So there's a big difference. And also, unless you're going on one of those shows that are really amazing, like House of Dragons. and uh, With TV, you're kind of like slotting into a machine that's just running. All right, it's just running. It's just, duh, 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 duh. Like when I did NCIS, it's actually kind of like nerve-wracking, nerve-wracking, even for someone like me who's done a bunch of stuff, is you go on and everyone knows everyone. It's just plug and play. They're turning up every week. They're doing the same thing. And it can be like super nerve wracking. And you're the one, if you've noticed, a lot of the time on those procedural shows, the guest stars have the bulk of the dialogue, right? So it's really nerve wracking. So not only have you got to go in, you've got to do a ton of dialogue, uh, but you're going into a well or machine where everyone knows everyone else. And they're looking at you and like, can you just nail this so we can move on and go to the next thing? So I think with, with film, it used to be anyway, certainly you'd look at film as like the blue chip. If you're doing film, you're at the top. And then TV's below. It's changed now because of the, the, the level of money that's put into television. But mainly it's time. All right. Uh, Michael Bays. <laughs> if you have a kid with actual talent, ability, desire, how do you pursue a career if not Hollywood? I would never send my kids to Hollywood. Never. Never, never. That's it. I'm trying desperately to get something sorted so that there will be a continuation for kids that are talented to come into an industry where they're not going to be exploited. Um, conservatives certainly don't get this. They don't understand. And they tend to just keep putting money into movies that nobody wants to see. You know, if you follow me on X, you'll know that I've said that over and over and over again. But, um, I'm really trying to build something that kids can come into because we desperately need the arts, right? We really do. The, the arts are a reflection of culture. And look at how shitty they are right now. So, so go figure. So I wouldn't send them into Hollywood at all. My son, when I did I Am That Man again, I, I had my son in it. Number one, because he looks like me, or at least remotely like me. Number two, I knew he'd be there because his parents were going to make sure he's going to be there. But also, he's got a photographic memory. I do not have that. Like, he can, like, read something and just repeat it. And he's a good-looking little kid. And the moment people saw that, they were like, I want to sign him. And I was like, over my dead body. No chance. The only reason why my son was in that, and it's a great, like, keepsake, right, for, for when he grows up. But it had got absolutely nothing to do with nepotism or anything like that. It was all to do with getting the movie done on time. And I would not put my kid in Hollywood. All right. There are three or more animations at the beginning of a movie announcing. This is from Daniel. Sorry. There are three or more animations at the beginning of a movie announcing a studio, another studio, some random, another studio. Then do the same thing in the titles at the beginning. What's that about? Okay. So a number of reasons. When you make a film, you might have the writer that has his own production company and it's part of the negotiations when you do a movie deal that you want your production company's card at the beginning and sometimes at the end. And there's a, there's a whole load of wrangling about order. It's all crazy because I know the, most people don't give a damn. But, or you'll get an actor who has a production company. Like I think Brad Pitt's is like plan B. He might produce that film, as in he might have nurtured that film, he might have taken the screenplay, and then what they'll do is they'll go to Sony, Universal, Warner Brothers, Disney, and they'll say, hey, listen, do you want to distribute this or do you want to fund it? And then that entity will say yes. So that's where their card comes from. Now, there might be 
a bunch of different people with that. There might be two actors. There might be an actor, a production company. There might be a separate production company that said like Lakeshore or whatever. And they'll, they'll have their card. They've got to deal with Universal. Universal then goes to Ridley Scott, who's got Scott Free. And they're, they all have their little, you know, chunks of the pie. So that's why you get that at the beginning. And often as well, if you look at movies, movie titles, like movie uh, roles, are different from film to television. So if you see an executive producer on a film, that might have been someone that either wrote the script or developed the script or put some money into it. There's a whole reason, there's a whole different litany of why people will get those uh, credits on a film. So don't look at it always and go, oh, it's executive. They might have done nothing, like absolutely no, or, or just introduce them, one person to another person. So this is one of the big scams that I see when in, in, in the independent world where they go out and go, oh, well, he produced it. I was like, oh, really? What did he do? What did he actually do on that film? Did he produce it? Really produced it? Did he just get this um, uh, uh, investor and bring it in? That's it. All right, so this is what happens. You need, for the Academy Awards, you get three main producers, three. So you'll see there's executive producer and producer. You get three main producers because they're the ones that go and get the Oscar. So there you go. All right. Um, say I had a line in a movie. This is by D.B. Cupper. Say I had a line in a movie. Would I be able to get residuals every time that movie played again after it finished in the theaters? Yes. Yes. If you are SAG, and this is where uh, the contracts and, and SAG have such a big role because they monitor the residuals. So if you have a SAG contract, normally you'll get residuals off that. Um, that was a big thing back in the day uh, for television because people started moving. You'd, you'd have SAG and then you'd have AFTRA. And AFTRA, from my recollection, didn't really get residuals. I think that's right. So you get like more money up front if you did a, an after show and then they merged and then it's all the same thing. So you should be. And that's why I was on Transformers and I can tell you all about that. Uh, and there was one guy who was a, a Marine, I believe, and Michael Bay, who is, he does this all the time. He'll go over because he wants authenticity and he'll go over and he'll give someone a line. He'll say, what would you say if this was happening? And, and the soldier would say, I'd say, you know, blah, blah, blah. And Bay will go, okay, say it. And, and I remember being next to this guy and he was like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I said, dude, do it. You'll make more money from saying that line than you will in your entire year in the military. So I hope he's still getting his money. God bless him. Um, Alan Murphy, what was it like working with Stallone, Bruce Willis, and Chris Nolan? All right. So Stallone was amazing. He's for any Gen Xers, he's exactly what you would imagine. The dude is the most hardworking person I know. He is super smart, like super smart. And he's also an amazing actor, and people don't give him the credit for that. I remember when I watched Rocky Balboa. I'll tell you if you want. I'll tell you a story. All right, so I'll tell you a story. So I initially, I get a call from my, my manager at the time. It's kind of funny because he was like, they're doing a movie. They're doing a Rambo. Uh, they want you to come in for it. I was like, they're doing a Rambo? Like the ra like Rambo Rambo? And he was like, yeah. Would you want to do it? I was like, oh, yeah, of course I would. So anyway, they sent me the role of Lewis. And um, that my friend Graham McTavish, nobody else could have played that role like him. He's amazing. And a great guy, a really good man, let me tell you. He's a sweetheart. But I know those guys, right? I've been around special operations people for 20 years. At that time, it had been eight years. Been around them a lot. And if you know any of those guys, they're on the down low, right? The SAS Delta guys, on the down low. They are not braggarts. They don't go out. And so I go in and I play the character the opposite way to what I say the opposite way to what it's written. I just played him on the like completely calm because I thought, you know, I mean, I'm a big guy as well. So, you know, you don't want to like flaunt that 
as an actor, you know, you should be able to walk in and, and your presence should be enough. And so they, they call me up. And at the time, Schoolboy was a seal. And the screenplay called for Schoolboy to take over from Rambo. So Rambo became like Troutman. And Schoolboy um, was, was, became Rambo, basically. But, but what Sly wanted to do was make him like the scalpel. Like he was the, the – Rambo was the blunt force – instrument like you know he he would bludgeon people to death schoolboy was the scalpel that would come in and he would be like super uh he'd be use technology to the best of his ability you know use every like like just a different version of which was smart right because who's going to follow rambo it's freaking rambo so i get a call and my agent goes um listen they want you for schoolboy i was like holy crap really he's like yeah and um, are you around this afternoon? Because Sly's going to call you. I was like, uh, let me, y- yes, I'm around. Yeah, I'm around. So he calls me and it's that voice right on the end of the phone. And, and he's like, hey, do you want to come around? I'm not going to do an impression because I'm not. He goes, do you want to come and hang out tomorrow? And I'm like, what is going on in my life? I mean, I grew up loving Rocky and Rambo. And I was like, yeah, of course. So I go and meet him. I go into his office. And uh, I'm walking in there and there's all these posters right up there. Rambo, Rocky, you know, Cobra. These movies that I I grew up watching. And I I walk in and he comes out to meet me. And he is, all these people like, oh, Stallone is small. He's frigging giant, right? He's, I mean, he's not massive tall, like like super tall, but he's, he's like this size. He's massive. And I see him walk out and I'm like, Oh my good grief. Like this is Stallone. And he goes, Hey, shakes my hand. We walk back in, we go into his office and we start talking about the script and, and he says, look, I want to make, um, schoolboy British. I said, look, I can do an American accent. He goes, no, 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 no. I want to make him British. And I'm sitting there thinking, this is really smart, right? Because who's going to follow Rambo? He's not only making him, uh, like the, the, the scalpel, he's making him British because everyone's going to be compared to Rambo and you can't be compared to Rambo. So I was like, all right. And then we got into a discussion about firearms, super smart guy, knows everything about firearms, knows about, uh, he was talking to me about arrows and why he uses arrows and this and that. And we started getting into the gun that I was going to be using, you know, the, Initially, it wasn't the Barrett. It was a Chaytech intervention, and then he changed it. He was, he was going through reasons why and why not. And, uh, and I said, listen, are you familiar with the, the British Royal Marines? I said, because the Royal Marines were commandos, Green Berets. Like, they were, the, they were the OG Green Berets. I said, so I thought it'd be pretty cool if he was, schoolboy was SBS, you know, Special Boat Squadron, Special Boat Service, whichever one you want to say. I said, and there's a little bit of a rivalry between the, the Royal Marines and the Parachute Regiment, which is where Lewis would have come from, right, mainly. I said, so they can give each other a little bit of stick. That guy just rewrote the screenplay. Like, boom, did it. Just took the idea and made it what it was. And we also had a, <laughs> we had a discussion. There was a, I'm probably the only person that has taught myself out of lines because the, he wrote this amazing, amazing monologue. He's a terrific writer. And he wrote this amazing monologue that was about me as a sniper and what I do. And, and I went up to him and I like, I don't know any snipers that would say this. Like, they're completely on the down low. And he was like, mm. neither of us are going to say anything in this film. And I said, well, you did get schoolboy. You did write schoolboy to take off from Rambo. So, you know, it is what it is. And, uh, and again, he said, yeah, you're right. That was gone. As a part on the boat when we're going, uh, and I'll tell you guys, we had some crazy stuff going in Thailand. Like we had people trying, threaten to kill us. Uh, it was amazing, a really amazing experience. And he's like so hardcore. Like he's he's jumping in the mud. Well, there was a thing with the pigs, and he's like jumping in the mud, moving. Like this is a guy worth hundreds of millions of dollars who's who's won Oscars, and he's just hardcore. He's old school, and I learned a lot from him. Um, 
So he, what's funny, he came up to me and he goes, uh, yeah, take that off, take that off. He knew what an actor had to wear. Uh, and he said, you know, you don't need that. You don't need that. That's going to kill you. You're going to be running a lot. You're going to be doing this. So he was amazing. I mean, there's, there's no two words about it. And he did, towards the end, change the screenplay to the film that you see now, which was disappointing to me because obviously I wanted a franchise. That would have been nice. But he was right. I mean, it was the right ending for the film. And he went on to carry on and have a resurgence in his career, which I'm very grateful for because who doesn't love Sly Stallone? He's amazing. So him, that was amazing. Bruce, I got a phone call and I got an offer to do Deadlock with Bruce. And I said, yes, I, you know, I just, I wanted to work with him. Met him years before. And my friend, Johnny Messner was a very close friend of his, or is a very close friend of his. And, you know, I don't want to talk about it too much because I grew up loving Bruce Willis. You know, who doesn't love Die Hard? It's one of the seminal movies of my, my young years. Well, all of them, they're all great. But um, Bruce was declining by the time I worked with him. I think it was like two. We got two movies and then he finished. We did, he did mine, then he did, I think, Gasly and Ali, and then he stopped. So it was... I mean, it was just an honor to work with him. I mean, look at what he's achieved in his career and in his life. And, you know, he's one of the three, right? Stallone, Bruce, and Arnold. I haven't worked with Arnold yet. But, uh, yeah, it was, it was amazing to work with him. Uh, he's a star, loves his family. That's it. Um, working with... Christopher Nolan, I was, I went in on Tenet and it's funny because, you know, I always, Michael Caine said to me, there's no, no such thing as small roles, just small actors. And I've always kept that in mind. And I, I got asked to go, I went in and there was, the Tenet had been cast and they'd shot like 90% of it. And they wanted someone that could come in that could, that looked like they were military that could act. And I've trained a lot with the military over the years. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an excellent fake soldier. <laughs> you get to, to look brave and play great roles without all the risk. But um, I've been very fortunate to, to train with the SEAL team. There were SEAL team guys, with Delta guys, with Army Rangers. Um, I've trained with all those dudes. And so, in fact, one of them contacted me and said, you know, I know Chris and and he should use someone like you. So anyway, I'll go over and I do Tenet. And it was, I was only meant to be there very briefly, but I'm like, I don't care. I'm going to go and I'll, I want to see Chris Nolan. And it was a giant action scene, like giant action scenes, the, the fight at the end of the film and four Chinooks, just, just insanity. And Chris was just in the middle of it. And when you know your role, like when you go onto a set like that, they don't need to be hearing from you. So quite frankly, what I did was I just did my job. I did what I was told. Uh, I wasn't in a position to sit there and chat with him. Although I did chat with the other guys. I was stuck in a car with Aaron Taylor Johnson and, and the, other, the other guys for a long time. Rob Pattinson, who is a, he's an amazing guy, actually. <laughs> he's a really cool dude. Uh, but I was stuck in a car with him because there are no seats on set. It's true. When anyone says there were no seats on set, so we would sit in the car for hours. And it was a giant scene. I mean, it, the amount of money that was spent was unbelievable. But he's a genius. And I hope one day to be able to get to work with him. I say properly because it's not like I didn't have a character, really. I mean, I, I just went in and... and played soldiers for a little bit, had a good time with a bunch of guys that I know that they hired a bunch of other soldiers, uh, real soldiers. And I got to be on that movie for a week, actually. Oh, was it 14 days? I mean, it was a week or 14 days at the end of the shooting. So I just, I'm not above it, right? I'm not above it. So I went in. But watching him work, he's a genius. He's an absolute genius. All right. How many guesstimate percentage of conservatives? Uh, I've already got that right. Like directors, stagehands. That's tough because how many people are conservative in Hollywood? I wouldn't know because I wouldn't tell you. I mean, there's certainly you see on set like people like walk off when people are going on rants because they do talk all the time like you believe exactly the same as what they do. 
I've had that multiple times with people just like, yeah, well, you know, I hate this person, bear, 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 and all these guys. And I'm like, you, you guys are unbelievable. Like, anyway. All right. Show us props or mementos you kept from shows, movies you starred in, or give us a story behind it. If you look behind me, I don't know if you can see it. Let me see if you can see it. No, you can't see it in this shot. But, um, okay. I'm not that guy, right? Like, I've kept mementos mainly because I thought, you know, my kids would want them. And I never took them out. They were in boxes for years and years and years. And when I moved to Dallas, I got a friend of mine, Tim Clemente, who's a, who's a Joint Terrorism Task Force, or the FBI agent. And I went to his house. He's got all these things on the wall of all the things that he's done. And I'm like, it's pretty cool. And I think for me, it's like a, a matter of humility. I don't want to be like, hey, look, I did this. But I found that people find this really interesting. I mean, I don't want to be talking about me. This is one of the reasons why I didn't want to do this YouTube channel, because I'm like, who wants to come and listen to an actor talk? But so I've got a few things around here, not that I can get into this shot, but maybe I'll do it on another time. But I've got the up here, you'd seen in my other video, I've got the knife that I cut my cast off from in, um, in Black Hawk Down. Actually, see that there? That's the beret I had on Transformers. I do have that. And here's the thing about Transformers. Like, if you watch that show, I believe, if you look on the special features, my character name is on there. They actually messed up my character name in the title. So for people that were out there, the haters that go, oh, you played SNS number. Yes, yes, that was a mistake. It should have been rectified. I didn't run after it. And my agent didn't run after it. It's a whole other story. But my character name was Captain Graham. And I was on that with Tyrese and Josh for, for about six months. And we have, enough, we have enough footage on that movie to do an entire movie about the military nest aspect of it. It was amazing. And Michael Bay is a genius. And uh, I've never known anyone do action like him. Uh, him and my buddy Paul Anderson, incredible with action. Just geniuses. People don't understand the pressure those guys are under with, when you have like F-16s come flying over. It's crazy. All right. Um, Paul Kincaid, what is the biggest challenges to do, to doing your takes? Um, all right, so a lot of people talk about going method. All right, they're like, hey, I'm, I do method. Uh, don't talk to me, blah, blah, blah. Look, the truth of the matter is, is there's all different ways of acting. Sometimes you get time to build your character. Other times, you don't. Other times you have to get there, you have to hit your marks, and you have to say your lines, right? It's not about you. If, if there's a big set piece where you've got Apache helicopters coming over or Blackhawks coming in, they just want you to say your line. You're not going to sit there and go, like, like, for example, if you're doing a shot where there's, we had in Transformers an F-22 with Starscream, it takes them a certain amount of time to go around in a circle. And you've got uh, forward air controllers like talking up, to the to the planes and you've got you know you've got all your things all the different elements there you do not have time to go excuse me uh i'm not ready i'm not in character just like, just say friggin line just say it so i think sometimes there's a challenge that sometimes you have to go and just do it uh another thing is you don't want to be impolite to people this is a big thing for me because when you have a when you're doing a scene so think about this you're doing a scene in a movie and they're spending $100,000 a day, 100 grand a day on a movie. And part of doing that film is you saying your line and moving on from the scene. Okay? So the pressure that is on you not to be the one that messes up, not to be the one that drops the line, not to be the one that doesn't hit your mark, it's it's a massive. And that's why, for the most part, actors get paid like they do, right? Because you, you get, there's a lot of pressure. And, and trust me, I, when I did I Am That Man, I had a bunch of people that I know, they're like, I'm an actor, I can do it. And once you point the camera in front of them, they go to pieces. They just like go, oh, pressure. Everyone goes quiet. There's 300 people around. We had a Rambo. There's like 300 people looking at you. And they're all going like, am I going to make my lunch? Right? And I'll, can you get the scene so I can go to lunch? Right? You are not the center of everyone's world, right? You, they have other things to do, but you are the center of the world right then. So you are the person that is reliant. And, and look, of course, you have 
moments where the focused puller doesn't get the right focus or the camera move isn't right or someone walks through set. But there's a lot of stress on you. So I think that that is a, a big challenge, especially when you meet people. And I, I love people. And I know what it's like to meet someone that you might have seen on television or you want to talk to or you want to ask them questions. And so I want to be gracious with that. But when you've got a big speech going on and someone's talking to you and you're like, I don't want to be rude to tell them that I can't talk to you right now. Right. So that's why you see some actors like go off on their own because the pressure is on them. And it comes across sometimes, I think, as people being snooty, but it's not. It's like doing the job. And everyone is reliant on you, right? Everyone in that area, that they're, they're all waiting. All the, unfortunately, and this goes to some actors' heads, everything there, I, like, I, I look at it as it is, I'm an actor, my job is to serve the screenplay, right? But at that moment in time, everyone is there to get your shot. So it's all on you, right? There's a lot of pressure. All right. Uh, what was the most, I don't know. Ralph, sorry, going back a bit. What, why do they think they're better than everyone else? Because everyone tells them that they're amazing. I cannot tell you. And look, most actors want to be loved. That's the truth of the matter. Right? What, whatever level you're at. And so for me, I'm going to get a bit personal. Even though I had an amazing upbringing, loving upbringing, my dad wasn't in my life. So I wanted to prove something to him. And I'm sure part of that is getting affirmation from other people, which is, <laughs> this is the worst thing ever. And anyone that's now been on social media now is like, you cannot do that, right? That is the worst thing because people are horrible. Um, so I think that they desire that kind of affirmation. And then when you are making people millions of dollars, they're going to give you affirmation. And in my little pea brain, I'm like, people like me. People like me. No, you are a commodity to them. And the moment that you are of no use to them, they will throw you away. But a lot of these people, they get adulation. They get told they're amazing. They live in a bubble. Nobody, nobody stands up and says, hey, you're wrong. Else, look what happened to me. You know, you stand up and you say, I'm not taking the vaccine, and you get absolutely hammered for it. You get called this, you get called that. People don't call you in because they're afraid of being associated with you, all that kind of stuff. Um, they're very weak-minded. So that's why they think they're better than everyone else. And they do. Okay, uh, poly girl. Uh, what was the most surprising thing you learned about the industry, good or bad? Okay, good. It's an absolute machine. People are very, very professional. And everyone rags on Hollywood. But the truth of the matter is, is it's like setting up a $100 million like, business and then collapsing it down after six months. And then setting another one up, then collapsing it down. Uh, very, very, very professional. Um, I'm surprised how intolerant they are of other people's views. Yeah, that was really difficult because I'm not intolerant of other people's views, even though I have my views and I'll debate people on their views, but I'm not intolerant of them unless they're like, you know, pedos or, you know, whatever. Um, Ralph, is Corey Feldman telling the truth about the pedo pimps? I don't know. It's not been my experience. I'm sorry. I, I wish I could, I could talk about that, but I certainly wouldn't. Um, give anyone the opportunity of um, exploiting my children. All right, Yusuf. I like TV film as much as an next guy, but I cannot imagine being interested in it as a profession. So I'm curious, what's the best part of the job for you as an actor? Well, look, if you don't want to be an actor, and I always wanted to be an actor, I think that for me, it was an element of escapism when I was a kid. You know, I'd just like go into this world of television. I remember watching Star Wars and and it was so amazing to me, this like fantastical world. Now, I think that, I mean, I'm a creative, right? So that world really appeals to me. Uh, I always wanted to come to America. Don't know why. It just was, was something that I always loved from a kid. 
And I like the idea of stepping into other people's shoes. It's not like, you know, some people are like, well, I'm an empty vessel and I go over and I become this person. I'm like, oh, and I can't get out of it. It's not like that for me. I, I, I love moving in different worlds and doing different things. I also love challenging myself. So, you know, you get to do a lot of amazing things. So I, I tell my, my kids all the time, it's kind of crazy. They don't appreciate it. But I'm like, I was taught to box by a world champion. I was taught how to race bikes by a world champion. I was shown how to lift weights by Stallone's trainer. I trained. My first experience with weapons was with the Army Rangers. I have jumped out of a plane with the Golden Knights. You just get all these amazing experiences, right, that open up to you. And you get the opportunity to go, if you want to embrace that, you can go take it and run with it. And it's amazing. And you get paid a good amount and you get to see the world. And after a while, it gets, I know this is going to say, oh, it must be really bad for you. But I was so fed up initially in my first, you know, maybe five years, no, a little bit longer than that, in Hollywood of just being in a hotel. I was just, please, I want to go home. All I did was see the inside of a hotel. And people don't realize that. And it's funny because in my, in my very early career, if you look at the movies I did, they were all abroad. They were all in like, you know, I, I did one in Fiji, Morocco, China, uh, China, China. Um, where else? Have I, Thailand. Uh, I've been all over the place. Very fortunately, I, you know, and you get spoiled because you see the world and stay in the best hotels and you get paid for doing it. It's amazing. But then, you know, as you get older, you want to put your, put your roots down. And, and I have a family now. So I'm looking at not going anywhere. I'm looking at not being around, not, not flying to different places. It's a bit of a nightmare. So anyway, that's definitely a, a bonus. But I love acting. It's, it's an amazing thing. If people could come on set and experience that when it's, when it's happy, when everyone's having a good time, there's not a better job in the world. So, uh, okay, Lady Merlin of the Two Lands. Why do so many people have cosmetic surgery when they've already broken into films? I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I think that certainly for women, there's more pressure for them because, you know, you get to a certain age and they're like, you're out, you're done. Uh, I know there's, I watched a film with, I'm not going to say who it is, um, but I, I watched a film with an actress the other day who was very beautiful when she was younger and she's just ruined herself now. She doesn't, her face doesn't move. Um, and I think for dudes, like you're getting older, that's cool. I mean, I look at the guys like Steve McQueen and he looks, I mean, I was very, I had a baby face when I was younger, so I couldn't wait to get some wrinkles, um, you know, and look a little bit rougher. <laughs> I've certainly done that now. Uh, but I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think it's pressure from people to achieve a certain level of beauty, which is ridiculous anyway. I mean, I remember looking at, like, there's no one more attractive than Helen Mirren, right? And she's like, what, 70? Seven, in her 70s? She's gorgeous, and she's totally natural from, from what I know. Um, do actors who lean left get along? This is from Truth Freedom 1776. Do actors who lean left get along with actors who lean right, or do people not talk about it? It used to be that they didn't talk about it. And then it's just, we don't talk about it. <laughs> they talk about it all the time. The left and conservatives don't. Uh, that should tell you all you need to know about, about the industry. It's really bad. They're not tolerant. Like I said, it's, it's really unfortunate. And especially with Trump, like people just lost their mind over Trump. It's crazy. <sighs> tolerant. Um, Melody. What most surprised you about Hollywood? Like I said, I think really their intolerance of people that disagree with them. That's really sad. Sumo, is everyone Freemasons? Does everyone have to be gay? You know, how many people, how many base people are there? There's a few base people, you know, but that you don't hear from them. I, I certainly have had actors call me and, and say, hey, man, thank you so much for doing what you're doing. I really admire you, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to say anything. And that's their kind of, that's their prerogative, right, to do. And that's why I keep telling you guys, they're still making their money in Hollywood. 
I'm not because I open my mouth. So the more you guys subscribe to this and click and share and say, hey, because you guys are the bosses, really. And we're seeing this with the way that things are falling apart with Disney. You guys are the bosses. So I know it sounds silly, but the more people that support, like click on that subscribe and support me, it gives these other people courage to come out and talk about it. And also we have to change this for people coming up because at least I got in it. Now you're looking and people are like, I'm never going to get into the industry. It's completely antithetical to what I believe in. I don't want to do nudity. I don't want to do this. I just got something the other week and they were like, hey, they really like you for this. Uh, Are you okay with gay sex and nudity? And I was like, no, I'm not. (laughs) I don't want to do that. And listen, my agent was amazing. They were like, okay. I said, it it just, I'm, I'm not responding to that as a, I'm too old. And I just don't want to do that anyway. I mean, I just want to do good quality stuff. Good luck finding that on the conservative side because it doesn't exist. Uh, okay. Julie says, whose job is it to plan out the order of filming? I imagine it's quite complicated, especially if, if a film has a lot of location. Yes, it's super complicated. And you have departmental heads that come together. Uh, sometimes you have to do it a certain way. Like there might be um, weather. For example, if you're going on location, there's weather might be availabilities of sets. There's a whole load of things. So you tend to, the director will sit down with the DP because the DP looks at the light and the unit production manager and the location manager and all that. And it's a big coordinated effort. It's very impressive. I don't think people understand when you do a movie like Napoleon, like Ridley, who's an, you know, Ridley walks around set like he's the calmest dude around and it's, he could have like chaos going on he's got such a center he's he's amazing uh but it's a huge job and especially if you've got someone who goes i don't want to do that i want it in this way or you've got an actor that says i only work chronologically for my character that's a nightmare right imagine that you got to shoot your scenes in chronological order oh nightmare all right winston says asks post weinstein is the casting couch culture still a thing it's always going to be a thing. They don't talk about it. But of course, um, Eric Parker says, sorry, and Mark says the same thing. Eric Parker says, if you write a screenplay, how would you go about possibly getting it to be read? Who would you send it to? And how do you protect against IP theft? Okay, IP theft. Firstly, you would go and register it at the Writers Guild of America. So you go on the website and you you pay the money. I don't know how much it is, like 25 bucks or something like that. And then they register your script. So that's a good way of doing it. Uh, once you send it out there, it's kind of like going out into the ether. It's kind of difficult to track it. Uh, and how do you get it to people? Well, you know, I had an incident recently. I don't, I'm not really going to go into it too much, but I wrote a screenplay. So just so you guys know, I don't really talk about this a lot, but the first screenplay I wrote was sold. The second one I made into I am that man. The third one uh, got, I was told by one of the top agencies, not agencies, production companies in the world that it was the best screenplay they read in three weeks. That's their words, not mine. And I was actually like, oh, I'm not going to write anymore now. (laughs) That's pretty good. I couldn't get that to people. And I'm in the industry, right? Because sometimes they'll go, oh, well, you know, he's an actor or blah, blah, blah. It's very difficult. And it's even worse now because the agents will block you from getting to the actors or they won't read it or whatever it might be. So right now, and this is the funny thing, what they'll say is they'll say, well, you've got a screenplay, who's attached? I'm like, well, what do you mean? And attached means you have an actor that says that they'll do it, right? If you have an actor that says that they'll do it, you don't need them. You just go to a studio and the studio will go, oh, okay, you've got Chris Pratt. He's worth X amount of millions of dollars. So yeah, we'll, we'll do it. It's really, it's a wacky way of thinking. So that's why you get a lot of people that do kind of dodgy things, especially in the independent world. They'll make offers when they don't have money and then they'll, you know, they've got a certain period of time. <laughs> they have to go out and raise the money else, you know, they've got to cough up millions of dollars to the actors. It's crazy. Or you get someone, you know, who's amazing like Keanu Reeves who will say, I'll do that because I believe in it. And those people are very rare. As you all know, he's an incredible individual. Very rare. Uh, I haven't met him, actually, but um, 
Chad Stahelski went on to direct the John Wick, uh, John Wick movies was the stunt coordinator on Rambo. So I got to meet Chad, work with Chad, uh, who was a great guy. And, uh, he had nothing but good things to say about Keanu Reeves. And, um, so did my, my business partner in California. She's met him a couple of times. She's what you see on the can. Nice to hear it. Right. All right. Uh, why are the most people in movie and television industry left leaning? I think the most people in the arts are left leaning uh, because you kind of come up with this like idealized world in your head, uh, and then you start paying taxes, and you're like, "Hang on a minute, oh, I think I should be involved in this politics thing. At least like know what I'm doing." But I have a theory about the reason why, and I'm going to take you right now. Contrary to popular belief. Most actors are around the same level, right? When you, get to, when you get to going into TV and film, most actors are around the same level. There's a few that are a little bit above. There's that Daniel Day-Lewis who's on a different planet, right? He's on a completely different planet. And then you've got pretty much everyone else. There's a few that are in between that, like, like oh, really excellent. Gary Oldman's up there with, um, with Daniel Day-Lewis. Denzel is up there. Um, there's a few. Small amount. but. For the most part, it's how good the people are that surround you, right? For the most part, who are the directors that you've worked with? Like people go to me, oh, you know, you were, you're amazing as schoolboy. And I'm like, I had a great script. I had a great director that understands capturing the moments, right? You don't change necessarily from job to job. You're pretty much around the same level. Now, that being said, I worked my way into that situation, right? And it, I can build, I can go back and look at from, you know, going to school for drama, get international youth theatre, doing commercials. First gig was Emmerdale. Second gig was Coronation Street. Blew up, was, was huge. Then I do a movie with Michael Caine. Then I come over and do Black Hawk Down. You can clearly see those steps, right? Like the way it goes like this. But other people don't. Other people, not everybody, right? But other people might get there and know in the heart of hearts that they didn't earn it. And that's really difficult when you look out and you see, certainly, I mean, in LA, you might be going to an acting class and all of a sudden some girl just goes, right, huge. No rhyme or reason. Now, I don't know why they why they had that meteoric rise to fame. Who knows? It might just be in the right place at the right time. That happens. Might be other things. That happens. But what that does is that gives you them. It doesn't mean I have no guilt about it at all. But gives them a sense of guilt because they know it could just as easily have been that person next to them. So with guilt, they tend to want to help, if you know what I mean. Like they look at people that might, they, they feel might be oppressed or marginalized. And so they, they want to help. And anyone that says like, you know, I, I tend to believe, you know, you got to work hard. If you work hard, you'll get there eventually um, without compromising yourself. That's why I think they're like that. And that's why I think that they, they lose their minds so much. And, and look, they're very emotional. Uh, just by definition, actors are emotional. So there is that. All right. Curtis Combs. Combs? Combs. Is the back-end money predictable so you can plan and budget? Or is it too small in comparison to your, uh, your normal fees to make a difference? What he's talking about back end is when you do a film, one of the ways that you can bring in actors that you would normally have to pay a lot more money is what you'll, you'll offer them what's called back end, which is a, a, a part of the sales of the film, a slice of that, because it goes into different pools, producers pool, talent pool, whatever. And so you can get a, it's what they, you've heard them say points on the back end, right? Percentage points on the back end of a screen, on a film. So, Let's just say you've got $10 million to make a movie and 
Leonardo DiCaprio really wants to do it. And you go, listen, dude, I've only got like $2 million to pay you. And that's because we've got to do it independent because I don't want to get the studios involved. So I don't them messing with it. And he'll say, all right, well, give me back end. And sometimes you might become fabulously wealthy from that. Jack Nicholson is an example of that. When he did the Tim Burton Batman, he took back end. I think Alec Guinness was like, what is this stupid movie about? Like, you know, space cowboys. And he took a slice of Star Wars. Uh, Lucas was different because he took the merchandise in. <laughs> Can you even imagine? Like, anyway. Uh, so rarely. I've had back end on a film and a couple of times, actually a few times, I've never seen a dime of it. So there's a lot of creative accountancy goes on. They're like, oh, well, we had to do this. And because the, the way that they'll do it often on a, on a film production is they'll pull um, expenses. So you might do one movie, but that, that is, that, the, exp- the expenses for that film are pulled across like 10 movies they're trying to push out. So you rarely see it. And I think they had that with Lord of the Rings, if, I'm, if I remember correctly. Not necessarily with the talent, but the estate complain that they never saw any money uh what's chris Nolan like from t bird as i told you i didn't really get to know him at all uh stallone awesome uh billy zane not the billy zane is it really that disgusting and a lot of them perverts also how many roles and parts are given uh, are given for giving up morals mostly sleeping with a decision maker how common is it for people to turn down such offers i don't know I mean, I've certainly been set up, you know, like someone's tried to get me to date someone else and I turned it down. So I never, I've been very wary about not putting myself into that predicament. Uh, Are people sleeping with the decision decision makers? Well, we know that's true, right? Yes. Uh, Not always. I mean, sometimes when you've got the studios breathing down your back, you can't do it, but you can certainly see, you know, certain people move up and down and i'm going to talk about this in a little while uh because someone asked me a question i'll peruse these earlier there's there's a question about um i'll get to that in a bit i'll address that third dimensional are they demons i don't know harrison sharp who really runs hollywood i don't know i don't know what that means honestly i've never been in that um i've i've never really prescribed to that kind of idea that there's some shadowy thing like running hollywood um curtis coombs why don't you still make music i had a bad experience um when i was doing music and um that's a whole long story um but i didn't i haven't sang since i left my recording contract i've been tempted a few times in fact you know since i got this set up i I started singing again on my own uh I think that, you know, there's also a, a big stigma. For those of you that don't know, I had a couple of songs out over in the UK. Uh, one, Yes, I Did, Sing with Beyonce. Uh, and the other one, Hearts, Lime, Desire. And I think that you look back, I wanted to, I was a musician as well. Like when you start out as an actor, you want to do as many things as possible to maximize your ability to make money. Musicals was one, was one of that. And back then as well, in the UK, you could certainly go and get a, a music contract. Like, it, it was a possibility. And I actually got offered a recording contract before I was in Coronation Street. And a lot of people don't know that. But I turned it down. I didn't feel like I was ready. And when I signed with Columbia Records, I thought, this is a company that is, although it's a Japanese company as far as Sony's concerned, Columbia was an American-based company, right? So, and they had a history of like Harry Connick and Will Smith and all that doing both movies and music. And that was the reason why I went with them. And the first, a lot of people don't know this, but the Heart Sloan Desire won Music Week Single of the Week. It was seen as one of the, one of the, one of the best releases of that year. And it wasn't normal for someone who was an actor to come out, apart from Natalie and Bruglia, to come out with an actual credible, credible, song and i think it it shocked a lot of people so i really pushed against going down the pop route uh i always want i did that's why i did the song she's gone with destiny's child 
I love that song. I wanted to do a cover. And I wanted to, there was a gap then, you know, Justin Timberlake and all those guys hadn't come out. It was the, the boys from Brass had like moved on from then, like Luke and Matt had, were doing other things. So there was a gap. There was some boy bands, but there was a gap. Robbie hadn't really um, taken off at that point. He was just, just getting out there. So there was a gap for a male solo artist, and I wanted to do R&B. That was always the stuff that I loved doing. And um, it was an amazing thing. I mean, I, I sang in front of thousands and thousands of people. I loved doing it. I think it was a difficult time to do it because I was a, a proper, let's see, I was a proper artist. As in, it wasn't just like I wanted to cash in on it. I'd already had the offer before I had any real success. So um, it's amazing to to think back and say that I've done it. But who knows? I, I did, someone did approach me last year about the idea of doing a big band tour, like a Rat Pack thing to go around the UK. And I was like, that'd be kind of cool. I'd like to do that. So who knows? That for some reason it went away, but it might come again this year. And I'd, I'd certainly, do I have to get like, I'm a bit rusty. Let's put it like that. Uh, Rob Sanchez Jr., were you part of the Friends of Abe? I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, Heath Starkey, do they <laughs> do they drink the blood of, bla- blood of babies to stay young? I don't know. I never saw it. Uh, Alan, who's the biggest prima donna you have worked with? By the way, my partner was an actress on Blood Pageant. Don't say it was her. her. Yeah, it was her. She was a, just a diva. Um. So, by the way, Blood Pageant was, it's funny because I had someone, it, th- these people, the, the people that come after you are always like, yeah, you did Blood Pageant. Uh. And I'm like, yeah, I did. I got asked to go and do a cameo on a movie where I got paid and I got to meet Snoop Dogg. Who's not going to take that job? I don't care what it is. Anyway, um, but well done for skipping all the other movies that took $1.5 billion at the box office. Yeah. And the double Oscar winner. They're so shallow, these people are so predictable. Um, who's the biggest prima donna? I've been really fortunate. I haven't really had any prima donnas. I think, I honestly do think that part of it is, in the majority of the movies I've done, I've been in the, on, in, at the top of the call sheet, which means, you know, you're one of the main actors. And there is a, an element of weight that comes with being an English actor. I, I'll tell you that right now. Does, it's just the way it is. And I've noticed that people people tend to just be different and professional. And, and also, like, again, I don't tolerate that bullshit. You know, we're all very lucky to be doing this and we're not digging ditches. So I don't tolerate prima donna behavior. So I can tell you this. The people I work with, Josh DeMel, sweetheart, Tyrese, lovely guy. Uh, I mean, I could go through them all. The, the, the majority of them are, are really nice people. Uh, all right. Zachary Fatim is Hollywood very liberal by choice or liberal because they get paid to be liberal. That's by choice. So I think they get paid as well, but, you know. Uh, Ace of Hearts, how needy are performance, performers? How needy are performers for attention? Love me. Very. Very. Uh, it's only for me as I grew up and became a man and understood what it meant to be a man and embrace being a father, being a husband, uh, not relying on other people's opinion for my own value. Because that's, you know, you do tend to, you know, it used to be when the reviews came out. I'll tell you the story. I don't know if I, I've already told this, but um, I did mention it to someone earlier on today. But when I did Anacondas, there was a review that came out and it said, Matthew Marsden's accent, British accent is terrible. That was the moment I was like, I don't give a shit. Ridley Scott said to me, um, it goes, Matt, good reviews, bad reviews, doesn't matter. Just as long as there's a lot of them. And he's right. People have all kinds of agendas. So, although in a, I, I do believe that um, Roger Ebert said that I was the one to watch from Anacondas. Just saying. All right. 
I don't know how you say this, Disford. You guys, you put normal names. It was really make it easier. All right, but Disford. When actors and actresses do a sex scene in the movie, do they also bang in private? Is this very normal in Hollywood? I've heard that's how Brad and Angelina got together. Okay, so what you have to understand, number one, no, they don't, of course. You know, they don't have sex on screen. Uh, of course they don't. Uh, for the most part, it's very unsexy. You know, when you do something, even a kissing scene, there's hundreds of people around you. You've got lights, you've got camera pushing in your face. They're like, can you move this way? Can you move? It's, it's just not, not sexy. <laughs> um, but what happens is when you are, let's just say, I did anacondas, right? So I go out to Fiji and we're in the middle of the jungle and there is one hotel that we're in and it's the crew and us, we're all together for months. And you don't see anyone. Now, I was dating my now wife, so I had someone there. But those kind of environments, it, they're like pressure cooker environments, right? You, like, you see each other every day, every morning, every evening. Uh, you go to dinner with them. You, you, there's emotions involved, right? Because you're working on a film. You might be doing a scene with that person. And then, you know, you might... I'm not saying it's for me, but different people have different temptations but you know for the most part the people that you're acting with are very beautiful as far as men i'm talking about women uh, they're beautiful and some people fall into that trap it's not really been anything that uh i've been this my, my kind of superpower it doesn't it doesn't really um, bother me uh so no i mean like i said full-on pressure cooker environment you know, you're away from people. It's a recipe for disaster, really. You know, unless you've got a really, really solid like moral core. Um, Hitman, can an alternate film industry exist without unions? Yes. Yes, it can. And in fact, it should. The unions initially were there to kind of protect you from being exploited, but now that they're prohibitive, I think, for the most part, um, they push the budget up. I think there's a way of taking care of the actors, taking care of the people that work, like getting a, a guild that, for example, does insurance, health insurance. For the people that don't know this, the majority of actors, I can tell you, are with SAG because they get great health care. Which, by the way, everyone lost their mind because everyone voted for Obamacare and then SAG pushed up the prices and whatever. And everyone's like, what's going on? I'm like, you guys voted for it. Um, all right, like we're right there. Uh, who's the biggest POS in Hollywood? My guess is this joke. If you don't know who it is, have a look. I don't know. I, I look at people sometimes and I think that they're just wounded. I know it's difficult when they come out with horrible things. They say horrible things and, and they're so opinionated and... <sighs> I, I, I just think people are broken. I just think they're broken people. It doesn't help, you know, I mean, it doesn't help me that I've had people shun me and, and not have me on set. And I know that there's a bunch of, I mean, here's the, the, the thing that, that kind of gets me more, more than that is why the phone calls don't come in from people that you know are in there that can make a difference, that can hire you. That's worse. That's worse, in my opinion. So anyway, um, I think that's about it. I'm looking. I'm seeing if there's any updates. Um, that's about it. I hope you enjoyed what I had to say about Hollywood. Um, I've got a lot of stuff going on around here. So if you can hear something, I really apologize. Uh, it, it's not going to be like this again. Please hit the like. Please hit the subscribes. It really matters. You guys are the boss and you allow me to do more. And hopefully, um, when, I, when people see that my following just keeps going up and up and up and people really want more decent content they don't want the woke bullshit they want and look i'm not even talking about you know conservative movies just just good movies right we just want good stories i hate the the when they say conservative film it's not a conservative film it's just a film right braveheart is just a film it's a great film but like it's just a film it's not a conservative film or, or like christian films i don't want to hear like oh it's a christian film if someone says to me it's a christian film i'm like see i don't want to be a part of it because normally it's crap Right, normally the, the levels are really low. You guys know it. You know it. And the truth is, and nobody's going to tell you this, or if they do, it gets drowned out. 
You guys call the shots. You are the ones that are going to change the culture. You, nobody else. You have the power. So when I'm sitting there and I'm looking and I, I seen in a few days, my, follow, my subscriptions on, uh, on YouTube have rocketed. That sends a message. You've got to understand what a big deal this is in the industry. It makes people go, hang on a minute. Whoa, what's going on over here? And you guys get to change it. But you think for the most part, and by the way, the people that have followed me, I noticed on my first video, I've got like 1,800 people follow me. I've got 1,800 people watch the video, which is amazing. So thank you. But you guys can make the difference. You think that you, you, you're disenfranchised. It's not true. They watch this. And you have to make me and other people like me undeniable. I talk about the guys like uh, Nerdrotic, like Gary. Critical Drinker is amazing. Uh, Ryan Canal, uh, Jay, the Geeks and Gamers, all those guys. They have so much power. Like They terrify the life out of the industry. and. You're going to have to thank those guys because they are basically pushing the industry back the way it should be just by going out there and talking about it and like torching them. And they're fearless about it. And these are guys, by the way, if I had my own studio, they're the first people I would hire because you know what? They love the material. They're true fans. They love the fans. And they respect filmmaking. That's what we need. We need to go back to this. Anyway, my little rant at the end of a very long conversation. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was enlightening to you in any way, shape, or form. Uh, please tell me what you want to hear. Tell me what you want me to discuss. And I will get on here. The more comments I get, the more subscribers, the more I'm going to be on here, right? I'm going to be on here more and more and more uh, because I'm in, in reality, I'm so grateful for you. I really am. I understand that I have a career because of people like you that have gone out and sat and watched the films that I was in and the television shows and supported me. And I'm very, very grateful for that. Very, very humbled. So let's go. And remember, not all actors are like this. I promise.